here. And in this video is going to be your part three of your topic seven evolution chapter. And in this section, what we're gonna be talking about is how genetic mutations may result in genotypic and phenotypic variation within a population. So first of all, let's kind of define what genotypic and phenotypic actually means. So genotypic is pretty much what we are talking, when we're talking about the genes that we have, our genetic code. So obviously mutations can adjust this genetic code and sometimes lead to good or bad things. Now phenotypic variations, phenotypic variations are what the physical characteristics are of the organism, what they look like. So the genotype codes, codes for the phenotype of what they look like in a population. So mutations are the things that change our DNA the most when we're talking evolution. So a mutation is just a, a, a change in an individual's DNA. Now the, it could be a nucleotide change due to an insertion, um, a substitution or a deletion, something as simple as that, or it could be something that affects the entire chromosome. Now, a mutation in your body could have two things. It could have a positive effect, which could actually lead to better survivability in the organism. It allows them to change a population, which is kind of how evolution occurs, or it could have a negative effect. Now, the negative effect is when it causes some sort of harm to the organism. Also, it can actually have no effect whatsoever. In other words, it, it changes a non-coding region of the DNA. So mutations are the driving force that actually affects evolution. Again, could be positive, negative, or actually do nothing. Now, genetic variation, when we're talking about this, we're talking about a measure of the variation that exists in the genetic makeup of individuals within a population. So in other words, what are the different alleles that a population has? So genetic variation of entire species is often called genetic diversity. And it's very important for organisms to have genetic variation so that they can survive in multiple different ecosystems around the world. So think about humans. Humans have such a wide variety of different phenotypes. Think about all the different um, skin colors, hair colors, eye colors, different heights, different weights, and all of these different variations that we have um, lead us to survive in different locations, which allows humans to survive almost everywhere in the world. Now genetic variation is essential for natural selection because natural selection can only increase or decrease frequency of alleles. So in other words, natural selection can't actually change your genetic makeup. What evolution does is it or natural selection does it only selects the alleles that are best for survival in that location. So it's important for populations to have genetic diversity so that nature can select which one is uh, able to survive the best. And obviously with changing environmental conditions, it's important to have a wide variety of individuals. So variation allows some individuals within a population to adapt to changing environments. So for example, you may not have seen this guy, but this is a gecko right here in a tree. Now let's just say that gecko did not live in a location where the leaves turned brown, but instead it lived in a location where the trees were always green. Obviously, this individual is not going to be able to blend in with those types of environments, so it's important that there is some sort of variation within the population. Maybe a leaf gecko that is brown as well as green so that it can blend into both different kind of conditions. So because natural selection acts directly on the phenotypes brown or green, more genetic variation within a population usually enables more phenotypic variation. So the more genes that are altered, the more phenotypes that are altered within the population as well. So genetic variation is advantageous because it enables some individuals and therefore a population to, to survive despite the changing environment. So for example, in fox, we have a couple different colors. We could have red fox, we could have brown coloration fox. There's actually some black ones as well. There's gray. So and then obviously you have the white one that you see over there. So 
why are there all these different variations within a population? And the reason for that is because these different variations lead these foxes to live in different ecosystems around the world. Obviously, the white fox would be very beneficial in the Arctic tundra where there is snow most of the time. So again, genetic variation is very advantageous because, again, it enables some individuals and therefore a population to survive despite those changing environmental conditions. So obviously... If the environmental conditions changed, they would be able to still be able to survive, maybe just in a different color organism. Now, adaptions to the environment, the more beneficial a trait, the more it will continue to show up in a population. So the best example I have are these two squirrels over here. Now, in Pennsylvania, when it was first founded, uh, the black squirrel was actually the dominant squirrel in that location. And that's actually a form of red squirrel and is going to be indicated by the red line on the graph to the right. Now, obviously, you probably very rarely has ever, ever seen a black squirrel. The dominant squirrel right now is a gray squirrel. Now, why was there this shift in coloration in the Pennsylvania forest? Well, if you want to think about it in terms of when Pennsylvania was first founded, the forests were very thick. They were not touched by humans. So what happened was the ground was a lot darker. There was less sunlight coming through. So the black squirrel was actually advantageous in early history of, um, of the squirrels. Then what happened is Europeans came in. They started cutting down the forest. And what happened is those forests began to become lighter and lighter. And as it became lighter, the gray squirrel then became the dominant squirrel within the population. So again, it's important why there is that genetic variation, but what it shows you is the more beneficial trait is gonna be the one that will actually be able to continue to show up in the population. Now, a real world example of this is actually the pepper moth. Now, the evolution of the pepper moth is an evolutionary instant instance of directional color change in moth um, population as a consequence of air pollution during the Industrial Revolution. So in early times, in other words, like throughout human history, this pepper moth right here was actually the most dominant one. And the reason for that is that pepper moth was able to blend in with the light colored birch trees that were very prevalent in England, in England excuse me, during the time. So the frequency of dark color moss increased at a time when the pollution stained the trees a dark color during the Industrial Revolution. In other words, when the pollution hit, the population shifted from the light color to the dark color because the dark um, population was able to blend in better than the light one because of the pollution. Now, as the Industrial Revolution kind of subsided and we started to use less and less coal um, the pollution began to reduce, and what happened is the light color then became dominant again, and we saw another shift of the population. So the peppered moth is a great example of how genetic variation and natural selection select the best um, coloration to survive. So again, this is a real-world world example of natural selection. So just think about it. If you were a predator and you're looking at the before Industrial Revolution, what's the first thing that catches your eye? You're going to be the one that eats the black pepper moth because it's easily distinguishable on the uh, light background. So before the Industrial Revolution, light pepper moth was camouflaged better than the black pepper moth. And this resulted in a, major, or a majority of light pepper moths being the dominant coloration in the population. Now, after the Industrial Revolution, if you look over there, what color do you see better? You see the light one, therefore the predators are gonna pick that one off. So the Industrial Revolution, the trees became black with soot and the black moth became more camouflaged, which meant an increase in the black population. Again, just showing how natural selection shifts the phenotypes of individuals in a population. So again, what we're talking about here with genetic variation is a gene pool. And a gene pool is all of the genes and their alleles present in a population. So think about it like, um, think about all the different types of dogs that we have in the world. All of those dogs are the same species. They all pool from the same gene pool. But what alleles that they actually pull from determines what they actually look like. 
So favorable alleles occur in greater frequency as time goes on because those are the alleles that are going to be selected for the best survivability of the population. So favorable alleles will occur more and more frequency as time goes on and on. Now, there are some factors that affect gene frequency. Obviously, migration. So migration is just somebody moving into a population. So the movement of an individual from one location to another. Now, if an organism migrates from one area to another, it takes its genes with them. So those traits are actually then passed to the new population. Mutations, again, the most driving force that we have in evolution. Mutation is just a simple change in the DNA or chromosomes of the individual. And then we also have genetic recombination. Now, genetic recombination is what our bodies do naturally. And pretty much it's just the reshuffling of the genes through a process called crossing over. Now, remember, crossing over occurs during... Uh, meiosis. And if you want to learn more about that, check out our meiosis versus mitosis video that we have from topic five. So each of these actually can cause a few things or uh, in our gene frequency. Now, uh, each one of these can cause a harmful trait to appear. They could uh, cause an improve survivability of the population or they can have no effect whatsoever. Now, the thing about gene affecting gene frequencies with these three different things very few of them actually lead to improved survivability it's very rare for one of these things to actually improve survivability which is why evolution takes a long time to do now the frequency of genes that are uh, adaptive or beneficial will increase in the population over time because they're going to be able to reproduce the longest and they're going to be able to produce the most individuals. We call this fitness. So again, this, uh, this uh, increase of survivability and this increase in reproduction and this increase in that specific beneficial gene is what we call natural selection. So environmental factors exert pressure for uh, selection of certain traits. So in other words, when we have a population, usually nature selects some sort of phenotype from that particularly. There's three different types of ways that this happens in nature. The first one is stabilizing selection. And stabilizing selection is when an intermediate phenotype are more fit than the extreme one. So in other words, we see a narrowing of the curve of phenotypes just to right in the middle of the two uh, extreme variations. Directional selection is when one extreme phenotype is more fit than all the other phenotypes. So we see either a shift to one side or a shift to the other side of individuals in the population. And then finally, we have disruptive selection, whereas both extremes are actually beneficial and the middle, the middle, the median, is actually the one that is selected out. So let's look at these a little closely between the two. Again, stabilizing selection, directional selection, disruptive selection. So let's start with stabilizing selection. Now what you'll notice in this uh, picture here, the graph that we have, is the dashed line is actually the original population. So for example, let's use an example where a medium green beetle might be the best camouflaged and thus survive the best. So on a forest floor covered by medium green plants, stabilizing selection tends to narrow the curve. So what we're actually seeing here is a selection for the median or the middle. So more individuals are going to be selected at this middle because the pressure is selected on the extremes. They don't blend in as well. We see a narrowing of the curve and stabilizing towards the middle. Again, stabilizing selects for the middle. Now directional selection is when our original curve is actually shifted to the right. So if the beetle population moves into a new environment with dark soil and vegetation, the dark green beetles might be better hidden and survive better than the medium or light beetles. So directional selection shifts the curve to the favorable phenotype. So it's going to be shifted to the uh, right that way. Our new curve is going to be more of one of the extremes. In this case, the dark green coloration that we have. Again, 
the curve is directionally shifted to the right because that is the individual that is best able to survive. Now, the last one we have is disruptive selection. Now, disruptive selection is kind of a weird one because instead of having a dominant, we actually have two peaks that form. So if the beetle moves into a new environment with patches of light green moss and dark green shrubs, both white and dark beetles might be better hidden and survive better than the medium colorations. So in other words, the selective pressure is selecting on the medium ones. So what we see is a spike at either extreme. In this case, a spike for the light beetle and a spike for the dark beetle. So hopefully this video helps you out on genetic variation and um, also genotypic and phenotypic variation within a population.